Criminology and Law and Society. She first joined Oatley Bigmond as a summer student in 2018, and she returned as an articling student in 2019. She was called to the bar in June 2020. During her time in law school, she was very involved with Pro Bono Students Canada, including working on two year-long projects. The first was advocacy dedicated to shifting the way that sexual assault cases are described in the justice system. The second was a placement with Small Claims Court in Ottawa. Laura's, is, Laura's experiences in this area have shown her the value of providing services that widen access to justice, something that BIST is very passionate about as well. Um, Laura understands res the resiliency after a serious accident does not build overnight. She believes that clients need an advocate on their side to navigate the complicated insurance system. Laura chose to practice personal injury law to help clients receive the support and resources they need to achieve as much normalcy as possible in their everyday lives. When not practicing personal injury law, Laura enjoys traveling, biking around Simcoe County, and watching the Toronto Raptors compete for the NBA championships. So. Hopefully that happens again this year. <laughs> uh, so without further ado, I will have Laura take it away. Um, so take it away, Laura. Thank you, Melissa, for that um, very warm welcome. Um, I just want to say thank you to BIST and PI Law. I'm really excited and honored to be here and talking to all the attendees. I can see all your names um, on the right-hand side there. It's exciting um, to be speaking with all of you. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, and I also recognize that uh, I'm glad that the Toronto Maple Leafs aren't playing today at 3 p.m. because I didn't want to <laughs> lose those ratings. Um, I know some people are avid sports fans, so um, that may, may have been a factor in, in their decision to come today. Um, so Starting off with this presentation, um, this is really about uh, how legal representation has been proceeding throughout this pandemic. So when everything kind of stopped in March, everyone was very uncertain about how things were going to proceed. Um, I know it was scary for a lot of clients because they didn't necessarily know how their treatment plans were going to be affected and they also didn't know if their lawsuit would still be going ahead. Um, here at Oatly Bigman, we really try to keep things as normal as possible, and that's where this headline comes from, keeping the train on the track. We really wanted the clients to not feel as much um, impact as maybe the rest of the world was feeling. Um, but for the most part, people have been pretty understanding with the delays and the issues that are faced by the pandemic. Let's go to the next slide. There we go. So um, in terms of a roadmap for today, um, some of the things I'm going to be touching on um, is the use of virtual platforms and remote working, client communication, obtaining records and facilitating medical examinations, accident benefits and dealing with the insurance companies, and some of the things that are involved in the steps of litigation, so such as examinations for discovery and mediations. And then once you get to the end of a file, um, if you're case makes it to um, trial, I'll be touching on that. And then also what's going on with motions um, at the courthouse because that does dictate a lot of the uh, ways in which our files proceed and the speed at which they're proceeding, as well as what's happening with pretrials, um, which is when we sit down with the judge and a, um, the other side, the defense, in order to discuss the case and get the judge's opinion on um, the file. So. I'll talk a little bit about all those things as we go along and feel free to submit questions um, and I'll try and answer them as best as possible as we move through. All right, so the first thing, um, when uh, everything kind of went from in person to the lockdown in March, um, things changed very quickly. Um, and it seemed like most lawyers and clients were understanding. There were a lot of cancellations within a short period of time, and um, the changes to virtual communication and remote working had to happen fast. I know in our office, our IT um, department was just completely overwhelmed with the request to work at home, um, but they implemented things um, pretty quickly because we already had a remote server 
um, operating behind the scenes that a lot of our lawyers and students and clerks used. Um, so that was really helpful in getting people uh, up to speed pretty quickly with working from home. And within the week of the pandemic starting, we had court reporters from reporting centers reaching out to us on how to work the virtual platforms and they wanted to find ways that they could still continue with the different processes in litigation, for example, examinations for discovery, without much delay. So while the cancellations were happening, a lot of different players within litigation were trying to figure out how exactly we could make things still happen um, in a relatively short amount of time. Um, so I know a lot of people were joking to me about how they wanted to buy stock in Microsoft Teams, Zoom, Skype, Google Hangouts, because that became the replacement for a lot of these um, in-person events. And it seemed like at one point everyone was using a different platform. Um, people were trying to figure out how everything worked. And it seemed that people were getting oriented to the platforms relatively quickly. Um, where we saw some um, issues were with clients, and you may see this as well, clients that may have um, a brain injury or some sort of disability that makes it a little harder for them. So we've been trying to get um, processes in place where we will set up the Zoom for them ahead of time. Our, our assistants will go through it with them ahead of time to show them how to use it. Um, and then also uh, creating ways in which uh, people can still participate and um, have help in the background. So some of our examinations for discovery, we've had clients who have their neighbor will come and help with them ahead of time. Um, and we have had a little bit of pushback in the beginning um, for people who didn't think that the pandemic were, was going to last as long. So they were saying, well, we can just reschedule this until things kind of go back to normal. But we're realizing quickly that things aren't going to be going back to normal um, as soon as everyone thought. So um, we're not going to be able to reschedule those in-person things. So people are becoming way more adaptive to using the remote connections. One of the things though that a lot of people around our office have been talking about and also my colleagues is the idea of Zoom fatigue. So you have to be very cognizant and what we're learning is how you book your meetings. So if you say you have four hours of Zoom meetings back to back, one hour each, it can become very tiring because you always have this feeling where you have to be on. Someone's always looking at you. Um, that doesn't happen in in-person meetings. You'll be sitting around a table and one person will be talking and everybody looks at that person and then somebody else speaks and everyone looks at that person. So this idea of Zoom fatigue is really um, taking shape because um, in the beginning, I think a lot of people didn't realize how tiring it is to actually sit in front of the computer and digest all this information and feel as though people are watching it for such a long period of time. So we found it's easier to break those meetings up into smaller chunks to say you have like one Zoom meeting in the morning and maybe one in the afternoon or do a lunch Zoom. Um, and that way you're not sitting with people staring at you all day. Um, one of the cons to virtual uh, working and remote working is what we're gonna see in September. So what is that gonna look like for parents or um, people who have dependents or older parents? Um, it's gonna be more challenging to find what the best setup is and hard, it's gonna be hard to balance and negotiate that time. Um, all right, we'll move on to the next slide. In terms of client communication, this is an example of a letter that we sent our clients. Um, uh, Mr. Joey Chibiani, we, <laughs> Uh, we had to take out the client information, of course, so, um, <laughs> but this is just an example of what it looks like. Um, so we sent this out to pretty much every one of our clients. Um, most clients were understanding. Some wanted to have phone calls and conversations about what things were changing and how their file was going to look like. But I think because everything happened at the same time in the world, people were very understanding about um, the changes. So it wasn't necessarily just our firm that was experiencing these changes. Uh, it was a global issue. So we really had to try very hard 
um, to have open communication between clients and the firm. And because we're no longer able to go to hospitals to visit our clients or their clients' homes, when we were retained by clients during the pandemic, um, we weren't actually able to meet them in person. So now uh, the ways in which we meet with our clients um, has shifted and we do the remote um, Zoom meetings or phone calls. Um, but now because everything's opened up and we're going to stage three, we are now able to meet our clients uh, in person. And so now we're starting to do outside meetings or um, park meetings, sometimes in their backyard, just uh, ways in which that we can find that we can interact with the clients and um, meet them because there's nothing better than an in-person conversation with somebody who's had their life severely affected and um, during the pandemic we really had to adapt to the ways in which we needed things done by clients so um, I remember a time when I went to a client's house and I had to drop off a retainer but we wanted to do social distancing and we were concerned about touching things. So I've actually put their retainer in a garbage bag and tied it to their fence um, and then ran away. And then they came, took the garbage bag, signed it, put it back in the garbage bag, tied it back up to the fence. So you just have to find creative ways um, in which you can communicate with their clients. And most clients are okay with virtual meetings and telephone meetings because they understand, like I said, that everyone's doing this that way. Right. In reference to um, records and medical examinations, it's we've always tried to be client centric. However, we found that we have to um, work on overdrive now during the pandemic. So because all doctor's offices and medical practitioner's offices, as much uh, I'm sure as some of you have experienced, they were shut down in the beginning. Um, and they've only started to open up recently. Uh, a lot are still closed. And so they will acknowledge the request for any records or anything, but it will likely be delayed. And so we have to communicate that to our clients. Um, and claims are becoming not necessarily delayed, just more lengthy. For example, if we're requesting police records, we know that instead of the 30 days, it's probably gonna take 60 or 90 days to get things back. Um, and one of the newest features that has, has started happening um, for us is that hospitals, instead of um, sending documents through the mail or providing CDs, they've started sending links for their records. Um, and this is a new thing, and we've had a lot of success in accessing those because they're tech typically very large documents. And it's exciting for us because this is a new change and our clerks can more access these remotely so they can just download the documents on their computer. They don't have to come into the office to pick up a CD or pick up the records. They can do it from their home and just upload them to our file. And because everything is now from, for the most part remote, a lot of um, places such as CRA and OHIP, the people who work there are remote they are processing things electronically and they have become delayed and backlogged. So we have to have that communication open with the client to say that things are gonna take a little bit longer than we had expected. For example, we used to follow up with our clients' doctor's offices in a few weeks, but now we're looking at more of a 45 day turnaround um, in terms of uh, doctor's clinical notes and records. And so just to touch on um, the medical examinations, so I'm sure a lot of you on here have either participated or in a medical examination yourself or um, sent a client to a medical uh, examination or conducted one. And so you probably um, experienced that the assessments were largely canceled in the beginning. They've started to open up um, and some have started to proceed virtually. Because some need to be done in person, they did have to be delayed. Um, but it's all about what the client and the medical professional is comfortable with. 
The interesting thing that um, these assessment centers have started to do is they've started to adapt and say, we will limit the assessment time by conducting the interview portion virtually, but the client only attends for the physical part. So say they have to go to um, a home assessment, they may do the physical portion um, in person, but any sort of background information that the assessor needs, that the practitioner needs, will be done um, virtually. And so we haven't necessarily seen files delayed much by the lack of assessments. It's just adapting. Sorry, Madison, is there a question? Sorry to interrupt. I actually have a question here for you. Um, the question is, is there any question of tampering with digital records? That's a good question. I haven't experienced that, and I don't think that, um, I haven't heard of that happening. Um, I think it's because the platforms that say the hospitals use or what I'm going to talk about later is like TD and Aviva are also using are pretty secure. They have their own um, privacy regimens. And so we haven't experienced that. We haven't seen it. I mean, I'm sure it's possible, but they're also still have to abide by FIPA and um, the privacy legislation. So um it's just a different way of communicating the records i haven't seen any tampering i don't know if anybody else has i haven't heard of it um but that would be an interesting thing to look out for it would definitely be a factor we'd have to think about okay um so the last thing i want to touch on in this topic is that we have seen clients who don't necessarily have the infrastructure to com complete the assessments remotely, such as laptops, Wi-Fi, or cell phones. And that seems to be an issue. So we've tried really hard. I know our clerks work really, really hard to find a way for clients to still participate in these assessments virtually. Um, but that is definitely a barrier uh, that we have experienced in terms of getting assessments um, set up is at typically older clients or uh, financially disadvantaged clients who may not be able to participate. So those are the things that we have to think about when we're setting up this assessment is how are we transferring the responsibility of the technological infrastructure to the clients who have to then ensure they have adequate Wi-Fi, who uh, may not have a computer, may not have a tablet. Um, those are the things that we have to think about um, that's new to us. So in talking about the accident benefits side, um, we've always tried to have good relationships with the adjusters. However, when it comes to the pandemic, it's been clear that there needs to be mutual understanding, that things are going to take longer, things aren't going to be as accessible, the assessments are going to be different. And so the biggest challenges that we had experienced through the pandemic on the accident benefits side is getting these treatment plans in place, getting the services in place, because the rehab providers were not permitted to see the clients directly on a non-emergency basis. And so they were only able to engage with their rehab providers if they had an emergency. And so we had to communicate that to the adjuster in that it's not because our client doesn't want to participate in the treatment, it's because they physically are not able to. And so, we had been sending um, CDs of records to offices when the offices were closed. And the insurers had to come up with a new way of sending and receiving documents on their remote servers. And so like I uh, alluded to before, TD and Aviva came up with these um, platforms as well that you they can send links through their own software. I mean, there's been a few bugs um, that they're still working through. Uh, the links are uh, particular to one person, um, you can't forward them to others, sometimes the passwords are wrong, but we do really appreciate them trying. Um, and that's where that mutual understanding comes in, because they still want to get the records, and they still want to provide that to their client and um, their office, so um, we think it's a very innovative way to do things. Um, and 
insurance companies going off of that point didn't seem to close through the pandemic. So they were still requesting things. They were still um, asking our clients to attend assessments. And so that became a little tricky um, because we had to kind of, like I said before, go into overdrive with our clients. Um, we had to liaise with them and the adjuster and the treatment provider to make sure that the file was proceeding ahead, but also um, acknowledge the realities of the world. And if there were any disputes with the insurance companies, we weren't able to schedule any in-person hearings and we're still not able to, so we could have over the phone discussions, um, which are proving uh, more and more helpful, but uh, it will be an issue in the future if we can't schedule these in-person hearings to adequately uh, hear the disputes that we're having. Um, we found that up until a month ago, there were no uh, catastrophic assessments being happen ha are taking place, sorry. Um, there were a few paper file reviews, um, but that was only if there had been an assessment done in person. And some assessments, like, such as psychological assessments, could proceed remotely. But things are still slowing, slowly get starting to get back to normal. Um, and that's only if the correct uh, PPE is in place. And it really depends on the client's um, perspective. So if they feel comfortable to attend the assessment and the practitioner does as well, um, then we can facilitate that. But we, have, we had to work on overdrive to make sure that those assessments were going to be safe for our client and as well as gonna be comfortable for the practitioner. And then if the assessment was not going to, be, to go ahead um, or if the treatment plans were not going ahead, we had to uh, liaise, liaise with the insurance company to explain why that was the case. For the most part, adjusters seem to be uh, very open-minded and they and understanding. You have the odd one who will push back a little bit. Um, and so it really just depends on each adjuster as to how the claim is proceeding. Um, I know we had a few adjusters who would ask the clients proceed with the assessment even, even when the treatment provider was open um, or pr proceed with treatment if the treatment provider was open, but public health was telling them to stay home. So we had to gauge the client's perspective, but then also communicate that with the insurer. All right, and so then I'll just talk a little bit about um, our perspective and my experience uh, dealing with the steps in litigation. So like I said in the beginning, when everything was first um, shut down, a lot of things were canceled. And even now, only the courts are starting to open up. Um, and so the litigation pro process had to um, catch up to the technology quickly. It wasn't realistic to just delay files until the pandemic was over. So the litigation process had to adapt. And so this process is archaic and it's based on uh, rules from the 18th and 19th centuries. Mm -hmm. And so um, it was exciting to me and I know to a lot of my colleagues to see that things were progressing quickly. Um, court reporters, it seemed, were uh, quick to adapt and implement new technologies. And um, also a lot of the mediators seemed to be accepting and positive to the fact that things were changing. No longer uh, did somebody have to drive three hours, say a lawyer or a client or a treatment provider for a step in the litigation process. Um, or for an examination for discovery. I know a lot of our clients um, are located in Sudbury, so we attend there often. And so it's not to say that that will change. We'll still be visiting up there very often, but it's to say that things are different. So say there's a snowstorm. We don't have to um, drive five or six hours in a snowstorm. We can propose that things are happening virtually. And that's exciting for us. We have some clients in Alberta um, who won't be able to attend examinations for discovery. So it's exciting for us that um, they would be able to conference in um, and that there's a new way of doing things. Um, as I've spoken about before, the largest hurdle has seemed to be the transfer of the infrastructure to the client. Um, 
they have to ensure that their Wi-Fi is up to date. And I know I've talked about already uh, having the technologies. Um, we've had a few clients um, have issues where their Wi-Fi goes down throughout the discovery and then things need to be postponed. And obviously it's understandable. It's just that that creates a new um, hurdle for us to address. Um, and it's something that you have to be cognizant about um, when doing anything, is that what is the infrastructure like for the client on their side and how are they gonna be able to go about doing things? Oh, one of the other things I want to touch on is that in mediations, when we sit down with a mediator and the defense side, um, it's actually been really great using the Zoom technology and that we start out in one room and then the mediator has control of the uh, mediation. So once it comes down to split up, the mediator will place, um, say myself and my client and a part partner at our firm in one room, and then the defense um, lawyer and their client in another room. And so the mediator will essentially go back and forth between the Zoom rooms and um, that's been really great because um, it mimics what you would experience at a live mediation where the mediator is going back and forth. And it doesn't seem to cause much headache. Um, mediators seem to be very open to doing that and they're very ready to do that. And it takes a lot of the travel time out of everything. So instead of going to the office um, and traveling maybe an hour or two, depending on what your commute is, you have an extra, an extra hour or two to devote to yourself or your work or your kids or your family or things that maybe matter a little bit more than <laughs> your, your everyday job. So that's exciting too, is that you can have that, um, that choice. And, but it makes it possible because everybody's a little bit more on board in what seems like in the litigation process. All right, so when, if your file happens to come to the end of the line where you see a trial, um, I was told in law school that about 5% of cases make their way to trial. I think probably seeing um, practice, it's more about 1%. And the problem though is becoming that all of these trials have been canceled. So it's created quite a backlog um, in the system. Um, and that's in reference to jury trials. There was actually about a month and a half ago, the, I believe it was Canada's first virtual trial, and uh, it was done all over Zoom, and all of the witnesses were examined over Zoom. The judge was over Zoom, um, and then a few weeks later, that same law firm had um, another trial over Zoom. So that's exciting to us that these trials can start proceeding uh, remotely. However, it looks like jury trials are gonna be canceled until the earliest of spring 2021. So um, while we're, it's exciting that, like I said on the screen here, 30 years of technolo technological developments were implemented within the past three months, it's gonna be a little bit longer until um, files are seeing jury trials. However, the um, provincial government has just come up with a new uh, document sharing platform. And this is exciting because um, typically in motions or pre-trials or trials, everything's paper-based. So you have to submit something to the court and then the other side submits something to the court and then it has to go back and forth typically through um, courier or the mail. And now everything is gonna be online. Um, so if you have to submit documents for the other side to review, you're not going to have to say drive it over or bring it to the courthouse or you can just submit everything online. Um, and so that makes it possible for um, judge alone trials to happen over Zoom because I know that um, the lawyers at Lesnar's Law who did the, um, the virtual trials, they were saying that they, that was one of their biggest issues is that they couldn't necessarily share their documents. So they would share their screen during the Zoom um, and then just email over the documents. So this new platform makes it a lot easier for us to share the documents. Um, 
And then I'll just talk I'll touch a little bit about motions. So for those of you who aren't aware, that's one of the steps in litigation if you need something from the court. So for example, and if you need a um, police uh, file and you don't necessarily want the redacted version and you want the unredacted version, you would request an order from the court to say that the police has to provide that to you. What we've experienced is that some of the delays are coming from not being able to proceed with motions. Um, about a month ago, the court system opened up so that they would um, proceed on motions and writing. However, one of the boundaries um, that we've um, had to navigate is that every court region is different. So some are accepting uh, motions in writing, some are not. So it really depends on where the file is located as to whether um, we're able to get um, orders from the court to do certain things. So that really factors into strategy when you're going through your file and communicating with your clients is that you may not be able to move forward on certain things because it may take you longer to get an order from the court. Um, the last thing that I'll touch on in terms of litigation is uh, limitation periods. So um, when you have a claim, you have two years from the date of the accident to file that claim. I believe in March or April, the limitation periods were suspended for the foreseeable future. And nobody really knows how that's going to play out in terms of litigation. So um, that's gonna be a huge uh, hot button issue in the future is when exactly are you able to file your claim? Um, are you outside of your limitation period? Are you within your lit litigation or limitation period, sorry? And uh, that will be extremely um, important for clients to be aware of when they're gauging whether they want to go forward with litigation. So say their ha accident happened two years ago, but the limitation periods have been suspended for three or four months, they have to remember, or when they're seeking legal advice, they have to be um, aware that they need to tell their lawyers that it may have, while it may have happened two years ago, there may be a limitation period issue um, because they may not be able to start their claim depending on when exactly the limitation periods were suspended and when exactly they um, started. I mean, that's an issue for the lawyer to figure out, but it's something for the clients to be cognizant of that they may still be able to start a claim, um, even though it's after two years because the limitation periods were suspended. All right, so that brings us to the end of the webinar. Um, I'm really thankful for all of you that stopped by and hopped on. Um, it's been really great to talk to you about my experience, uh, Lori, lawyering through a pandemic. Thank you so much, Laura. Thank you for being an amazing first presenter in our PAA Law Summer Webinar Series. So you got us off on a great foot. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I'd love to invite the the guests who are joining us today um, to ask questions, as we mentioned in the chat box or the Q&A, um, but not just questions. If you have anything you want to contribute to the discussion, whether it be on, you know, if you're feeling Zoom fatigue, what strategies you think work for best, work best for you if you have a meeting or if you have two Zoom meetings in a day, um, please feel free to share those as well, because I think those are really useful tips that anybody can use. Um, and if we were meeting in person, we'd have a chance to kind of have more conversations around what people are doing, how we're coping, strategies we're using. So please feel free to put those in the chat box as well. It doesn't just have to be questions. It can also just be comments or suggestions. Um, while we're waiting, I have a question, uh, a couple actually. Um, so just, we are also struggling a little bit. Um, we know there are members out there who have a increasingly hard time connecting with BIST. Um, uh, for lots of reasons. It could be screen fatigue, it could be access, like you were saying, to technology devices. Um, and even, you know, it's a little easier now that we're getting into phase three, but a lot of places where people would go to access free Wi-Fi, such as the library of Starbucks, were also mm -hmm. closed. Um, so I'm just wondering for folks who were kind of involved in you know, a motor vehicle accident claim or something where there was a lawyer and insurance company involved, was the insurance company a little bit more I hesitate to use the word lenient, but a little more accepting of, you know, needing to be able to provide those devices to people that you were working with? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it always comes down to the reasonableness and, and whether the um, 
item is necessary. So if we were able to um, show to the insurance company that in order for this person to get back to what their life was like before, um, and that therefore it was reasonable and necessary to have access to these devices, then the insurance companies, um, it did seem, you know, I did actually have this conversation with one of our accident benefit specialists, and it, they did seem a little more open to providing things that they wouldn't necessarily be able to before, because it was that reasonable um, need to access treatment that they couldn't necessarily do on their own. Um, and also they weren't necessarily using a lot of the funds that they typically would use, say, for um, taxi um, funds or um, travel or those sorts of things. So um, it always came down to the reasonableness or, and whether it was necessary, but we did see an uptick uh, of those sorts of um, submissions to the insurance company on behalf of the clients. Um, it really just depended on each person. Okay, thank you. Oh, uh, we actually have a question here. Um, so you mentioned that this has lengthened the process. Um, in this person's case, it, it has been 5.5 years to six years. And this person was told that that was the average. How much of a delay to this is expected? Um, thank you for the question. I think it really depends on where you are in the litigation process. Um, and it really depends on what stage your lawyer feels like you're at. So um, some cases that have just started, say the accident was this summer, it won't really be delayed by very much because by the time that they say went to trial, hopefully things will have adjusted to the point where it's not necessarily a huge delay. The issue is if, if your trial was slated to start, say, in May, you and you were gonna have a jury trial, say, if you're at that point in your litigation with 5.5 years, it may be kind of, you know, getting to that point where you, your lawyer is thinking about either gearing up for trial or thinking about trying to settle or, you know, having those conversations. Um, it really depends if, you're where you're at in the stage. So your trial could be say delayed until next spring. I know some of the lawyers in our office are working on um, some research to strike um, jury notices. So what that means is that um, you wouldn't necessarily have to proceed with a jury trial even though that you've requested a jury trial. And in BC, um, there's been a few cases coming out of this, the uh, Superior Court there that say, that based on access to justice, people need to move forward with their claims. So they've been striking the jury notices. Hopefully something like that happens here so that these um, files can proceed um, judge alone. And even in Barrie, we're seeing come October, they're gonna be doing a um, trial blitz. So if your um, case is slated to go to trial in uh, the fall, you're going to be placed on a list and they'll go through the list and whoever's ready, they will get their trial. Um, but like I said, it just really depends uh, where you are um, in the process. Thank you. While we're waiting for any other questions or comments to come in, I, I'm going to put Melissa on the spot, the other Melissa. Do you want to wave, Melissa? <laughs> Uh, so we are going to be doing a couple of social media posts in the coming week, uh, but this is Melissa's second day here at BIST. Uh, Melissa just began at BIST, and it's, it's quite timely that we're talking about uh, the changes in technology and, and virtual interaction, because that is why Melissa joined us here at BIST. So Melissa's job at BIST uh, for the next couple of months is going to be reaching out to our members. So if there's anyone who's on here who might need some support or know somebody who needs some support, uh, we're gonna be looking at doing a technology drive and making sure that um, people know how to use all the new platforms that are out there, such as Zoom. Clearly you know how to use it because you're on here. But if you're struggling with anything else, uh, connecting to medical clinics virtually, um, you know, 
accessing our support groups, Melissa is here to help you. So she's here to provide any type of case management support that you might need, whether it be accessing your medical clinics, again, your pharmacy, your prescriptions, anything like that, um, but also helping people get connected to technology in whatever way that means. So whether that's helping you acquire a new device, um, acquire somehow some way to get data so that you know you don't have to go to the Starbucks or the library to connect with people, um, or just to provide some education on how to use the technology. So you have it, and then if you're like me, you're like, oh, what do I do with it now? So she'll, she'll be able to do that piece. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot, but do you want to say any words, Melissa? <laughs> Thank you. And for now, if you have any questions about Melissa, her role and her program, um, you can email us at info at bis.ca and we will get back to you. Sorry, Melissa, if you could just repeat, I don't think that um, everyone could hear. I think the audio was off. Okay. Oh. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Um, that some people couldn't hear. I'll just do a quick recap. So Melissa's grateful and happy to be here <laughs> and ready, ready to help anybody with their technology needs. So again, whether it be getting devices, figuring out how to get data, or just learning how to use your device, um, or if you're having any type of problem accessing ODSP, um, housing, Melissa's got you. So um, right now you can email info at bis.ca or call our info line 416 8301485 and uh, her caseload's wide empty right now so it's a good time to get in or wide open I should say not wide empty I'm sorry <laughs> all right does anybody have any other questions or comments for Laura or for the BIS team We're good. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for um, thank you first and foremost to Laura and for PIA Law for their summer webinar series. Uh, we're looking forward to the next two weeks. Um, and again, thank you so much, Laura, for uh, for doing this for us. Oh, and one of our members said said thank you as well in the chat box. So we have, thank you so much for having me. We appreciate it. Um, Okay, so I think we're going to end the webinar. Look out for it. It will mail it out to the attendees and anyone who has signed up and wasn't able to physically join us today, um, but we'll also put it up on bis.ca slash webinars where you can find all of our webinars from the start of this pandemic. Um, nice to see everybody. Take care. Nice to see you. Bye. Thank Bye. you.